Father, what a joy it is to be in your presence. What a joy it is to be in the presence of your people, singing the praises of your Son. Father, we do thank you that you did send your only Son to die on a cruel cross in our place. And it is in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we gather, that we pray, and that we have hope. And no matter who we are, where we're from, the color of our skin, the language that we may speak, the week that we have had, no matter how deep our sin or how wide our transgression, that the cross of Christ, the blood of Christ covers all. And that in you we are made whole, Jesus inaugurated into fellowship with the Trinity. And that by the power of your Spirit, we can live an obedient life to bring you glory, to bring you praise. Would you bring us comfort through your Spirit this morning, O Father? Bring comfort to the Trost family. With the recent home going of Don, will you just pray your blessing upon the family, upon Joanne? You give great mercy and comfort. We pray for Danny Adair as his health continues to fail. We pray for that family, our dear brother in Christ, and for many others here who've recently lost loved ones, or maybe it's even been several years. We just pray that you would meet your grace right where they are at. Strengthen them. Encourage them in your presence. As we open your word today, would you help us to behold wondrous things out of your law? And may you receive all the praise. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'd like to welcome you again this morning, no matter who you are, where you're from. Glad to be here that the ice storm has passed and that the latest snowstorm swung to the north. Be praying for those people who are still in its path, but hope you enjoyed that. Many of you joined us online as we had a little bit of a mini devotional service courtesy of Facebook and the technology of the internet, so praise God for that. And if you're visiting here, uh, we do want to welcome you. And as we talk today, you saw the video, the announcements, you heard the testimonies. I encourage you to stop by at the Grace Care Expo in the International Plaza, an opportunity to be able to talk with people, uh, maybe about something you're wrestling with. Maybe you have lost a loved one. Maybe it's recent. Maybe it's been years to help process through that grief with other people who are walking through that. Maybe there are things that you're wrestling with that you don't want anybody else to know about. Well, let me be very blunt with you. That's where Satan wants to keep it. When we keep those things in shame internally and do not address them, then we begin to live in fear and in worry and anxiety, and that sin only grows. But like exposing fungus to light, we expose sin to the truth of God in the presence of the community of believers, and God can do amazing things. Don't be fearful. We are all sinners in need of God's grace. And I'd encourage you, go over there and talk with someone. Just begin the conversation. Take the first step and see where God would lead you. We are a church of broken people, and brokenness and hurts are a part of this existence, it seems. We see it, we know it, we experience it ourselves. Some of the deepest hurts and experiences and wounds and groanings of our spirit, however, are at the hands of other people. The hurts that we incur from others, and often the hurts we incur from other sheep, other Christians. This morning, let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. We well, come to a section of Scripture where Jesus, anticipating this reality, knows that there will be conflict and challenges and even hurts within the context of his church. And so he begins to give instruction for how to confront and to deal with those things. Internal division is perhaps one of the greatest challenges and most dangerous aspects that the church faces. Now, as we think about heritage and praise God for his grace, not anything we have done, but purely by his mercy, he has blessed us as a church. 
This past Christmas, we took an offering for the Four Corners Christmas offering, building God's church around the world. And I'm thrilled to say, by his grace and by your sacrificial giving and him working through you, over $92,000 was raised to build God's church throughout the four corners of the globe. (laughs) Praise God for that. I shared a couple weeks ago that as of the beginning of December, we are a debt-free church. And the opportunities that God has put in front of us are amazing. But let's be careful. Let us take heed that we stand lest we fall. Let's continue to guard the good deposit that God has given us here at Heritage. Let us look forward with anticipation, but be aware of the fact that the enemy will look to deceive, to destroy, and create dissension among us. In the 3rd century B.C., there was a young Greek monarch, Alexander. He consolidated the power of the Greek city-states after inheriting the throne from his father, trained up and raised up a professional Greek army that had battle tactics that revolutionized warfare, battle tactics that later even the Romans adopted. In the first blitzkrieg the world had ever known, or the first lightning war, Alexander swept across the Middle East conquering everything in his wake with such speed that even to this day it is an amazing feat and that history remembers Alexander as Alexander the Great. His empire stretched from Greece all the way up to modern-day India. Even the mighty Persian army was no match for Alexander. The Greek empire in the providence of God was used by God really to prepare the advent of the Messiah and the gospel. Because as Greece swept across the Near East, Alexander put in place a policy called Hellenization or Hellenism. What that means is is that everywhere that Alexander went, he sought to bring Greek culture and Greek language and to make the people part of the larger Greek culture. So that many cities, cities throughout the world today, even, for instance, Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt, is named after Alexander. What this did for the gospel is that uniting the world, or the known world, under one language, that when the gospel did come on the scene, that people were able to communicate and intercommunicate like never before. And that is why the gospel originally is in the Greek text, and it spread at surprising speed. The Romans, after the fall of the Greek empire, came in, built upon that Greek culture, and then united the world politically. So that we see in the book of Acts and the the, the apostles and the disciples traveling to the far corners of the globe to proclaim the gospel. And again, between the Greek language, the political unity that the Pax Romana under Rome brought, that Roman peace, the gospel and the church of God was built across peoples from every tribe, tongue, and nation with astounding speed. Now, what stopped the Greek empire, though? Let's go back to that. What stopped Alexander? Well, he died at a young age, but the empire, the armies were still in place. It was not a greater army than the Greek army that stopped them. Matter of fact, after Alexander died, his empire was divided into four different regions according to the four generals that served under Alexander. Some of them you may know from history, or maybe all of them are literally as Greek to you. But their names were Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Ptolemy and Seleucus were the most powerful of the four and exerted the greatest influence on the ancient Near East. Seleucus, his descendant, Antiochus Epiphanes, was one of the most cruel dictators over the Jews. But what stopped the Greek empire was not a greater army, but after the empire divided, these four men devolved into civil war, and it was the internal conflict and strife that brought the Greek empire eventually to its knees and then subdued under the Romans. You see, military tactics, as you go to a war with someone else, one very effective military tactic is not only to go to war and to fight, but to sow discord and dissension and miscommunication in the ranks over here. So that you can divide the enemy before you even begin the attack. So effective is this military tactic that in World War II, uh, the French resistance fighting the Nazis in, in, in France 
uh, worked behind the scenes in preparation for the D-Day Normandy landings, sowing miscommunication, disunity, sabotage, assassinations, anything they could to disrupt the enemy behind the scenes. So that by the time the Normandy invasions happened, many historians think that D-Day would not have been successful were it not for the French resistance working behind the scenes to sow division. Satan is no fool. There is nothing that can stop the armored march of his church. Jesus gave the marching orders in Matthew 16 where he said that even the gates of hell cannot prevail against my church. So what does Satan do? He works behind the scenes. So is discord and division behind the ranks. And perhaps today the greatest threat that the church faces is not external or political or even persecution, but it's the internal complacency of allowing division and discord to be sown in our midst, tolerating it, and then the church implodes. Are not some of the greatest hurts that we face, even as Christians, they're not from without. Often are they not from within the church. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus specifically mentions the church only twice. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, after Peter stands up and says, you are the Christ, son of the living God, Jesus says, blessed are you upon this rock, upon you, Peter, and on your confession, I'm going to build my church. Your marching orders are to move forward because nothing can withstand my church. The second time Jesus mentions the church is in Matthew 18 with instructions and warnings about internal division and how we deal with conflict and how we learn to forgive. Because not dealt with that internal division, the root of bitterness, the lack of forgiveness can fracture and disrupt the church. How many churches have been planted, not because of an intentional effort to build the kingdom, but because one group couldn't see eye to eye with another group, could not learn to forgive, and a schism happened and people went different directions. Jesus, knowing the tactic of the enemy, then comes to Matthew 18, 15 with the instructions for how to deal with conflict. Now, we've been looking at sacred relationships, the shepherd to the sheep, and now we're looking at God's people. This Sunday, we're looking at dealing with conflict. Next Sunday, we're going to look at learning to forgive. Because of the weightiness of these issues, if we can, let us just stop and pray one more time with every head bowed and every eye closed. And in the silence of this moment, would you just pray and ask God to help point out any area where you need to pursue resolution or give forgiveness with whom and ask that God this morning would just prick your heart with his word. Jesus, this is your holy bride, your church. Forgive us our frailties and help us to pursue her purity and holiness, even as you pursue it. Work in our hearts today, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, 
It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Jesus is teaching in familiar territory. North side of the Sea of Galilee and the city of Capernaum. Now I like to show these images to you because it takes what we know, maybe even growing up, learning about the Bible, and places them in real geographical, historical locations that exist, bringing a concreteness to our faith that is beyond, yes, the internal evidence, absolutely concrete in and of itself, but sometimes the images can help give us an idea. Capernaum, sitting on the Sea of Galilee, this is the seashore, where most likely, not far from right here, Jesus looked at a couple of fishermen out there in the water, maybe knee-deep, tending their nets and saying, come, follow me. Leave your nets. Follow me. Now, little did they know after that call was given of the angst and the challenges and the heartache that they would face in the upcoming days. Even as they were confronted with their own sin and Jesus challenged them to live in obedience by taking up their cross, denying self. In Capernaum, there is a 4th century synagogue built upon the ruins of an older place of worship, uh, this is probably very close to where Jesus gave many of his sermons and many of his instructions. There is even a place there in Capernaum, uh, the remains of what is thought to be Peter's house. Now what you're looking at in the picture, those walls there, are the remains of a 4th century octagonal church. A church that was built upon traditionally the site of well, again, what they thought was Peter's house. How do they know that? Because the remains of Peter's house inside seems to be a semi-larger -lar dwelling. And on, the, on the, uh, the sides of the walls, they've discovered much, a lot of people must have gathered there. There's little scribblings on the wall and little reminders. Maybe as someone was teaching and it talks about uh, Peter in one little scratching. And then there's Christian symbols there. So there's some evidence perhaps that this is uh, Peter's house. Even if it's not this exact one, it's within a stone's throw not too far away. But Jesus is here teaching and he brings a child into the midst and says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, humble yourself like this little child. He then moves on to say that God's sheep are precious to him. The shepherd loves the sheep, desiring that none should perish, but that he is reaching out and drawing them in. And yet maybe he's anticipating the objection of those sitting out there saying, yeah, accept that sheep. I don't care about that sheep. Do you know how they hurt me? And Jesus says, okay, well, here's how you deal with that. And here's how you forgive. And we'll look at that next week. The scripture here begins with, if your brother sins against you. Verse 15. If your brother sins against you. And the initial reading, it seems like, Scripture is talking about an interpersonal offense, and yet we come to a little bit of a dilemma here, and we're going to take a little bit of a tangent because the original manuscripts, or some of the original manuscripts, uh, or early, for, forgive me, some of the early manuscripts who don't have the original originals, omit against you. So Matthew 18 actually reads, if anyone sins, go and confront him. Now, if this omission is exactly reflective of what was original, then it broadens the spectrums beyond just simply being an interpersonal conflict. But if you see a brother or sister sinning, you have a responsibility to go and confront them. If it's the reading as we see it in the ESV and other translations, then it is talking about an interpersonal conflict. If someone specifically has offended you, here's how you deal with it. Well, with that textual variation, can this book be trusted? Now, we looked at this last week, I'm sorry, not last week, but the week before, and if you want, you can go online, watch that sermon. I'm not going to rehash everything I said there. I'm going to build a little bit on it and talk about how do we trust this book. Now, let me state up front. I believe absolutely this book is an errant, authoritative word of God can be trusted as a historical document revealed from the Holy Spirit to give us power for how to live today. It's also our hope for tomorrow. But how do we answer these questions? On what is our faith built? If you don't have any external evidence, our faith still must be apprehended by what I just said, by faith. There's many things we don't understand and know. But are there things that attest to the reliability of this text? Well, actually, interestingly enough, not too long ago, at Tel Dan, northern Israel, 
ancient site of Dan, which is an ancient city, they were doing some excavations and it uncovered an inscription that said King David. And King David, with his reportings and come of his, uh, his military campaigns, so archaeologically, here's a major historical figure attested to by history that they found. So his, King David's a real person. How do we attest the validity of this document or any historical document? Well, you look at the internal evidence. You look at things that we've discovered about external writers. What do they say about it? You look to see if it does it fit within the time period of history it seems to be talking about. How do we know when the book of Acts was written? Well, let me give you a couple of simple pointers. We know it was after the time of Christ, right? So it's got to be 80, 30, 32, 33, 34, or later. Could it be first, second century writing? Well, in the book of Acts, we have nothing about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, if you're a historian writing about Jerusalem and the Israelites, and Jerusalem is destroyed in 80, 70 by the Romans, don't you think you would mention that in the book of Acts? So evidence suggests, among, we're building a case here, it's not one thing as a slam dunk with one thing, but evidence suggests now that we have Acts being written sometime between AD 34 and AD 70. So now we have a general dating approximate. Does it line up with what we know about Roman traditions and other Roman rulers? And the answer is yes, we've discovered some things like that. Some other evidences. Archaeologists have uncovered from the city of Jericho. Now, Jericho, the ancient site, is, is the oldest continually lived city in the world that we've discovered thus far. It's the oldest city in the world that we've discovered thus far. Some data tracking puts it at 7,000 to 9,000 B.C. Now, Jericho has been destroyed many times. And every time you destroy it, it leaves a layer of destruction. And so they just build upon that wall, build upon that destruction. And then over time, you get all these layers of stratification of the ancient city. As archaeologists were studying these layers, they came to one specific layer. It was unique. It, didn't, it wasn't destroyed in the same manner that all the other layers had been. They looked at it and said, it looks like the walls came crumbling down like all in one instant. Sound familiar? Now, is this a slam dunk in of itself? No. Is it continuing evidence to point to the validity of the document that we had in front of us? I would say yes. Now, I can give up a lot more examples. But if your question is, if you're questioning the, the validity of this document, I would also ask that you use the same criteria with other accepted historical documents as you use with this one. Let's pull this apart for just a moment. If we look at this text, and I mentioned this last time, and I wanted to put this up here because I thought it would be helpful. If you look at other historical texts on the left column, the oldest manuscript that we have compared to the date it was written. So Livy, written, writing in 59 B.C. to AD 17, somewhere in there, the earliest manuscript that we have of him is 400, 500 years after his writing. And we only have 27 manuscripts. If we go down to Herodotus, very, very well-known writer. He wrote 484, 425 B.C. Uh, the earliest one that we have is, again, 500 years later, and we only have 75 copies. If you go to Suetonius, 69 to 140 A.D., the earliest manuscript that we have is 9th century, 800 years later, and again, that's the most we have at 200 manuscripts. Now, if you go to a secular university today and you're talking about Herodotus or Tacitus or any of these guys, by the way, Tacitus... Nobody questions his authenticity. It just doesn't happen. And yet, the earliest document we have is until 800 years after Tacitus, and we only have three. Okay, what I'm arguing for is consistency and criteria. Let's go to the New Testament. I said last week that we have the earliest manuscript is 2nd century. I want to correct something. There is actually that fragment right there that has been recently discovered. It's a fragment from the Gospel of Mark that dates to late first century. Which means this, that document, that fragment, was written within the first generation of Christians after Christ. Oh, and by the way, hundred you know, written during the first century, and our oldest manuscripts span anywhere from 100 to even 1,000 A.D. We have 5,000 manuscripts on top of the tens of thousands of other manuscripts that are in Arabic and Syriac 
and all of these other languages as well. So if we're arguing from a point of consistency, the New Testament is in a class all by its own that this book has unique testimony to its reliability. Okay. Scholars have said, now there's, there's slight variations between the texts. Like I just pointed out, this one says sins against you, and this one says just sins. Can we try, how do we know which one is right? Well, let's use a little bit of uh, brain grease here, elbow grease for the brain. If the first one, if anyone sins, not against you, but anyone sins, is that consistent with the rest of Scripture, to confront someone lovingly in their sin? And the answer is, yeah. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 actually says this, if, when we're looking at consistency theologically, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual shall restore him with this spirit of gentleness. So is this consistent with other doctrines? So if we go this way, it's not inconsistent with what the rest of Scripture teaches. That if we are to confront, but here's the thing, it's not confronting with a witch hunt, trying to expel and to call people out. It's a spirit of gentleness, the goal of which is to draw someone back into the fellowship with Christ. Okay. So it's a plausible scenario. Now, the second one, let's look at this. If anyone sins against you, how do we look at this context? Well, if we look at verse 21, I'm going to ask you to turn there. Chapter 18, verse 21. How does Peter understand what Jesus is saying? In verse 21, he doesn't respond with, well, well, Jesus, can you give me some methods for how to confront this person that I may not know? He actually takes it very personally and says, all right, Lord, I hear what you're saying, but how many times do I have to forgive him? I don't want to. How many times do I have... He's taking it very personally. So how does Peter understand Jesus' words? If someone offends you personally, you need to deal with it, and then you got to learn to forgive. So based on this context and scenario, I would argue that what we're talking about is a specific individual sin in this context. Now let's go back to the bigger question here. So how do we know? Can this document, can this book be trusted? Scholars have posited that even if we accepted every textual variation, it would not meaningfully change one aspect of doctrine or theology about what we know about God. When you look across that time spectrum and thousands of manuscripts, that is as good as a historical certainty as it is humanly possible. Therefore, I would argue, using the criteria even by normal historians, this book is an amazing work of art and an accurate depiction of God and his will and his truth. Now, you say, okay, that's all real good, Pastor. Let's get into the meat of the text now. I mean, you're looking at your watch right now. Don't worry, we're going. We're getting out of here by 1.30, right? Okay, good. Jesus gives, in this passage, instructions now for how we deal with those personal offenses because I wish, you wish, the church always looked like this. And by your laughing, I now know that you don't see the church this way. We, 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 we do hopefully see God's people grow in love for one another, but often, Often our experience is not just walking through life with hugs and smiles, but constantly going from one fight to the next. And then there are those people that just seem to say all the wrong things right at the right time. You can read that for a minute. You're all like, I have no idea whether or not I should laugh at that. <laughs> Let me just read it for you. Will that be helpful? Candid opinions, he looks at Susie and says, you're a bat-faced, bug-eyed, booger-nosed, baloney brain beetle butt. <laughs> I can't believe the pastor just said those things. <laughs> and yet, if we're honest, we probably feel like some people have said similar hurtful things to us in our life. And how does the metaphor metaphorical Susie now address that person and express how that hurts her and demeans 
her. Jesus gives four sequential actions. Go, take, tell, and treat. Go, take, tell, and treat. Four sequential actions. You may not have to do all of them, but if you do the first one and that doesn't work, then you move on to the next one. You go to the next one after that, and you don't skip over sequences. They're to go sequentially. What does Jesus say? If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Step one, go and tell him alone. Now, brother is inferring both male and female. It's, it's implying a, some sort of spiritual relationship. This is not a process that is for the world outside the church. Jesus is talking about his church. Now, that being said, are there great principles here that you can apply even in an unbelieving world? Yeah, go value the person and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And if that doesn't work, fine, bring the evidence, establish the witnesses. Number three, well, the church authority doesn't exist in the outside world. Therefore, what is the next authority? You know, there are some principles here. But Jesus is talking about his church. If your brother or your sister sins against you, how does someone sin against me? This is not just a strategic or a preferential difference. And sometimes we make that mistake. Because we disagree on the color this wall should be painted, you must hate me. That's the culture we live in today. Any type of disagreement is a personal attack, which is the ultimate sign of personal insecurity. We can disagree about things and not be a personal thing. It can become personal. But here it's talking about those who sin against How do people sin against us? Slandering, gossiping. Misrepresenting, there could be a whole host of ways in which they hurt us. Sometimes the most frequent way that we have hurts is by uncommunicated and then unfulfilled expectations. I have an expectation of you or you have one of me and it's never communicated, but then when I fail or you fail to live up to that, it creates hurt. Oh, how many marital issues are because of I expected dot, dot, dot. You never delivered dot, 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 but then you never talked to even identify that was an expectation. But even among Christians, you come into the church perhaps and you expect the church to fill all these things and sometimes you're expecting the church to fill things that only God is supposed to fulfill. That hole in our heart is not going to be filled with community. It's only going to be filled by a resident spirit who comes by faith and trust in the Son. Hurts, pains. But if your brother sins against you, and whatever that is, go and tell him his fault with you and your prayer posse. Is that what it says? No, it says go and tell him what? Alone. Go and talk alone. Why should we go alone? Why is it important to keep that circle small? Because perhaps you, you, you've gotten your group and you shared it on Facebook. You got your prayer group. You got your prayer posse, your DC class. And it starts off in a prayer request like, hey, would you guys pray for me? So-and-so hurt me deeply. And I don't want to mention names. You don't even, I'm not mentioning names. Um, just, just so that you know how to pray. She's got dark hair. She's on the left side of the congregation. Her husband does this. And uh, she goes to the 930 service too, if you want to know that too. So, so we give these things to, to try and build our case. And then maybe we go in there or we, after we tell everybody, then we address it. Now here's what happens. If you go and then you address the fault and then you realize it was a total misunderstanding to begin with. They, they never meant to hurt you. Now you're faced with the, I got to go back and tell my prayer posse that I was wrong. That takes someone of great humility and courage to do just that. But that's what you have to do if you're going to do what's right. But if you do according to what Jesus says, then you go and him alone, you give the opportunity first to be reconciliation so nobody else needs to know about it and be brought into this mess. And then their offenses, be, or my offense become their offenses, and now instead of just one-on-one -on -one being offended, it's one-on-20 on being offended. And now instead of just having to reconcile this, now you've widened the circle, and this person now needs to be reconciled with everybody else who now has a negative opinion of that person. Oh, man, Satan is good at what he does, isn't it? 
how quickly it fractures and fractures body, life, and relationships. Now the goal of this, let me be very clear, the goal of going is not to enter into debate so I can say, I am right and he is wrong. The goal, Scripture says, is to gain your brother. The goal is not thinking in terms of right and wrong, but in relational reconciliation. And you say, hold on, Pastor, you need to know what is right or wrong. Let me put this out there. Have you ever been frustrated with someone so long that you have forgotten what it was that hurt you? And now you have to go in, and frankly, I'm not sure we're going to be able to determine, humanly speaking, who is in the right and who is in the wrong. So I am coming here to humble myself, and my goal is I just want to regain my brother or my sister. Aha, pastor, there we're at. I don't want to gain them back. You don't have a choice, and that's what next week we're going to be talking about. We are commanded to forgive. And this is the process of walking out forgiveness practically. Going one-on-one, valuing, hearing, hoping for reconciliation. But if that doesn't work, then step 1B and step 1C. And what I mean by that is try it again. Why don't you try step 1 multiple times? The goal is to gain and to reconcile. The goal is not to race through the process so I can say, I've done it. But if they won't listen, go to step two. Now I'm going to bring in a couple of witnesses so that every word may be established. Now don't prepare your witnesses. Here's what you're going to hear. Here's my case. So they're going in on your side. If you're truly seeking reconciliation, hey, would you come and just, I'm not going to talk, tell you what it is, just come in and sit in. And would you help here so I can, maybe some of it's my fault. And then these witnesses can truly be independent parties to help guide through the process. So that every charge, Scripture says, may be established. Satan deals in generalities. God deals in specifics. So it's important to sit down and say, here's how I'm hurt. Let's talk about them. Here are the issues. Let's be specific and let's deal with them specifically. Now, Proverbs says in Proverbs 19, verse 11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. If you can overlook an offense that some, you don't like my sweater, I'm sorry, I hope it's not a Matthew 18 issue. It's the glory of a wise man to be slow to anger and to overlook an offense. But if you can't, you go through Matthew 18. Take one or two others that every charge may be established. But here's something that's so, especially in the context of marriage. Sometimes the husband or the wife wields Matthew 18 and reconciliation as a law to bash the other one over the head with instead of holding it in tension with Galatians 6 and other passages that as you pursue reconciliation, it should be with kindness and gentleness In 1 Corinthians 13, that love keeps no record of wrongs, that love is gentle, patient, kind. Let this characterize the manner in which we do Matthew 18, whether it's in the context of a marriage or a friendship or anybody in the church, that even the manner in which we go about it reflects God. Now, step two fails. Tell it to the church. Ooh, if there was ever a scary passage that people don't like, it's this one. What is the church? Well, Jesus is speaking before the church is even really formally, if you will, come into existence. It's it's still a a loose gathering of people. Acts begins to see the church come into kind of an organized structure. So he's saying, tell it to the church. But what do we mean, tell it to the church? Do we tell it to the leadership? Do we tell it to the whole congregation? Or are we talking the universal church here and we need to kind of broadcast it across the internet? I'm going to argue that the potential answer is yes to any one of those. Whoa, pastor. Okay, now, I'm, now, now, now you lost me. All right, let me, let me wrestle with you, hopefully, and unpack why I say any one of those potentially could be viable categories, and then use an illustration that will hopefully give some clarity. After Jesus gives these instructions, he then says in verse 18, 
Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Let's dispel a myth right up first, and that is the verse 20 that this is talking about worship. Where two or three are gathered in my name, woohoo, we can worship now. That's not what it's talking about. When it's saying here, two or three gathered in my name, he's talking about the formal representation of people gathering together for the sake of Christ to talk about the purity of God's church and the confrontation of sin. This is not a warm and fuzzy verse. This is actually a very, very severe of reminding of the authority of Christ being exerted upon his people. Besides that, whether two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. If we talk about this and apply this for worship, isn't God present with just one of us? Amen? Yes? Does the Holy Spirit reside within you? Okay, so discard that. We're not going to say any more on that. 1819. So what is he saying here? This is actually a, re a recapturing of what he said in Matthew 16 to Peter. I'm giving you the keys to heaven. What does he mean? Does Peter get to sit at the pearly gates and determine who walks in? No. What is he doing? He is formalizing that the church is an authority on this earth to be reckoned with. Now authority, man, that's a dirty word in our culture today. We don't like the concept of authority. Because we look at authority through the, 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 the lens of those who abuse it, use it, misuse it, all for their own ends. But if we think about it, is not God himself an authority? Is he not the authority? Is he not a perfect, good, loving, kind, just, patient authority? Has not God established the state government as an authority? Romans 13. Has he also not established the family as a governing authority? And then the church itself is also a spiritual authority. Now let's not take this to the extreme where some super Christians who are in charge perhaps, and I say that I'm not a super Christian, I'm saying that sarcastically, get given titles like popes and you have to obey my authority. He's talking about the vested authority within the community of the believers that I'm accountable to you. You are accountable to me as a leader in God's church, but you're also accountable to each other. There's this cross-section of accountability and mutual authority. What is Jesus saying in these verses? Well, to be honest, some of it I honestly am not sure. I do know this, that God is not changing things in heaven depending on what we decide here. The greatest argument here is that when we act in accordance with his name, that we are living out what has already been decided in heaven. That we are acting in accordance with heavenly principles. But what we see here is God's entrustment of authority into his people. And then when it's ex exerted appropriately, then it reflects him. Now, now what did that have to do with who do we tell it to? Because there are so many things, and I wish that scriptures delineated when you encounter A, do B. I wish it did that in ministry. I wish I knew exactly when it's a biblical divorce and when it's not, and when it's a biblical remarriage and when it's not. I wish it stipulated every single course, but what we have to do as elders, oftentimes with sticky, thorny issues, is get on our knees and say, God, what is the best, most wise scenario that brings you glory and is in the closest accord with your revealed word? And then we move forward just trusting that he will use us in spite of our frailties. Therefore, tell it to the church. In exercising of that authority and wisdom, maybe it's appropriate that it only goes to the leadership at times. Maybe because of the nature of the sin, it needs to go to the, the entire congregation. Or maybe because a church evaluates and says, you know what? I'm just going to throw out some big names, not because these guys have sinned. I'm just, they're well-known names. Uh, James McDonald, John MacArthur, whose pulpits have reached millions of people. And were they to fall into sin, 
perhaps it is best practice actually that they do put it all over the internet for the sake of transparency of Christ's body. Maybe it needs to go to the universal church. The application of wisdom and seeking the right heart to exert this authority, and it's an authority that should reflect God's personality of holiness, righteousness, justice, valuing of people, kind, gentle, the goal of reconciling. If you have a bad taste of church authority in your mouth, my guess is because it's been exerted wrongly or because you're still living in sin. Tell it to the church. If that doesn't work, last step, treat them as an unbeliever. How do you treat an unbeliever? How do you treat someone who's gone through this process? Scarlet letter on the back? Never talk to them. Every time they walk by, you kind of do the 180 and give them the cold shoulder? Christian, how do you treat an unbeliever? Talk back to me here. How do you treat an unbeliever? Love and what? Grace and what? Patience and what? Kindness. This is how we are called to treat the Gentile and the tax collector, as Scripture says. Anybody who is not of the community of faith. Therefore, if you are sitting here, by the way, and you do not know Christ, you're wondering what this God is all about and what we believe, I hope you hear as I talk to our people that they should treat you with kindness, love, grace, and patience, remembering that they were once in that exact seat where you're sitting. Here is the truth that we are to respond in grace and love. But practically, let's also be clear. The treating of the Gentile and tax collector may be removing some levels of trust or access. We don't let an unbeliever fill this pulpit. That's a place of trust. You're welcome here, but this is a place of trust that a demonstrated life many levels of leadership and and service in our church. You have to be a believer, a a child of God. But treating them is not showing them a cold shoulder, but recognizing because they're not responding to God's calls for repentance, perhaps they really aren't a believer and they're just going through the motions. Therefore, start showing them grace and preaching the gospel to them all over again. The goal in all of this is not to exert Shame. The goal in all of this is trying to draw a brother back to Christ. In the last few minutes here, literally the last two or three minutes, I do want to drop a couple of grenades. Like I haven't been doing that already all morning, right? These grenades that I want to drop are meant to help spawn a conversation with you, not to answer all your questions right here. Given the reality of sexual abuse, physical abuse outside the church, and unfortunately, let's just be honest, unfortunately it has happened inside the church. Do we apply Matthew 18 absolutely for such heinous sins? That's a very practical question. Someone who claims to be a Christian and there's been molestation or sexual abuse or physical abuse, is it God's heart that you go and tell him alone? put yourself back in the power of that individual. My heart wants to say no. But I need to know that there is a scriptural foundation for that no, if indeed that is a legitimate exception. Now to be clear with you, I'm going to argue there is an exception. That the majority of Matthew 18 offenses cannot be reasoned away that you should follow Matthew 18 to the T. But there are certain levels of heinousness of crimes that I would say if there is that level of crime and hurt and transgression, that number one, it calls into the question, are they really a believer? So whether Matthew 18 applies to them at all. Number two, I would also argue that this is an illegality anyway. Such crimes are illegal in the face of our government and therefore fall under the purview of the state Romans chapter 13. We have not been entrusted as the church with executing, imprisoning, or dealing out types of civil justice. There are times when there must be love, reconciliation, and unfortunately relegating certain people under the powers of the state. How 
However, however, if this is in your past, don't begin with a blog. Begin with a small circle. Keep it small. How horrible it would be if you were wrong. I am not saying sweep it under the rug. I'm just saying start small. Take the first steps. Get wise counsel. Let's figure out how to take the next steps and to come out from underneath that abusive and corrupting and destructive relationship. But let's do it in a way that brings honor and glory to God, not in a way that further besmirches his bride. Let me be very clear. This is not an argument to wipe it under the rug. I'm just arguing for due process so it goes into the appropriate places at the right time so that the victims may find joy and freedom and reconciliation and healing. These are sticky, thorny issues. Another thing is if someone tries to pursue you, man or woman, You shout out no and you fight tooth and nail back and that is step one. Okay. Grenades dropped. If this is you, please come talk to us. Let us help walk through some of these challenging scenarios so there can be healing, growth, and glory to Christ, but at the same time, protection for those who are helpless. The majority of offenses, without exception, Without, sorry, without question, there are certain exceptions, but without question are these interpersonal things that Matthew 18 should be applied. So the question this morning is not just to come up and pray about what you should do, but rather to respond in obedience. Who do you need to go talk to? Who do you need to go start the process of forgiveness? This is not a recommendation. This is an ultimatum from your king. From the suzerain, sovereign Lord of heaven who says, I love my bride. I love my people. Fight for my people. She's valuable to me. Confront. Deal with sin. Offer forgiveness. Because is that not what I did for you? Walking the path of the cross in order to show love and mercy and grace and kindness. Even when I was hated, I went to the cross for you. You've been given heaven. And yet, you can't forgive this relatively small offense in comparison to what you did to God? The challenge this morning is very direct. Don't compromise the body of Christ by your disobedience, but think about right now where you need to start walking out Matthew 18. Where you need to be obedient to God's word. You say, Pastor, I don't have forgiveness in my heart. Don't wait for a feeling. Just start marching in obedience and watch God do wonders. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you pray with me? Father, I pray if there is someone here who does not know you, that they would come talk to me, one of the pastors up front. Father, I pray in the frailty of my words that there was no misunderstanding or added hurt but I do pray that there was clarity. I pray that if there is any division in our midst, any unresolved issues or unforgiveness, that you would begin working among us right now to purify your bride so that we might stand before you without shame, but with joy that we lived in accordance with your word. Be with us now to be obedient this week. And in Jesus' name we pray.